Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Is it all right if we get into the Word tonight? Because what I want to do is I want to just share, it's a simple message, but it's a message that I'm living right now. And so we preach out of the abundance of our hearts and what God has put in our hearts and how God is dealing with us. And so in my almost 64th year of life here on planet Earth, I am dealing with some things that I'm not exactly happy or excited about. Can anybody else going through that same experience in your life? Uh, I don't know where we ever got the idea that Christianity was a bed of roses and it was a cakewalk because it's not. And it's filled with many challenges and many trials and tribulations, but the Lord Jesus delivers us out of every one of them. So it's not that it's a perfect life, but we have a perfect God. We have raised a family, Jim and I, and our sons and our daughters are in ministry, and there was touch and go there for a long time. When they were teenagers, we just didn't know what was going to happen. We were ready to kill them and repent later. Some of them sent us to hell and back, and... God rescued every one of us Cobras, and every one of us are serving the Lord. So we have a great testimony as a family. And it isn't about perfect people or perfect families. It is about a perfect God. But tonight, I want to deal with the subject of attitudes. And I want to talk about three attitudes, and there's so many. There are so many. We could go on and on and on, and we could be here all night long, which... I don't want to be here all night long, and either do you. So I'm only going to give you three tonight. But I want to look at three attitudes that will change my life if I will change my attitude. Three attitudes that can change my life. So having said that, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see my notes. Oh, there you are. Okay. Let me define what is an attitude. Are you ready? An attitude. An attitude is the way you think and feel about someone or something. A feeling or way of thinking that affects a person's behavior. It's a way of thinking and behaving that people regard as unfriendly, rude, prideful. So an attitude is the way that you think and feel about someone or something. So if an attitude is about thinking and behaving and feelings, then attitudes are really in touch with our heartstrings and the feelings that we have as human beings. God gave us emotions and he gave us feelings. He made us in his image. And these feelings are not bad and they're not wrong, but we as believers have to learn that we can't live by our feelings, but we have to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And therefore, because of that, we often can have attitudes that can actually circumvent and stop the blessing and the move of God in our lives. And therefore, I have to readjust attitude and I have to be honest with myself. So I'm going to give you three attitudes tonight and I'm going to give you three things to do to change that attitude. Is that all right? So you can write this down because it's going to be the same through every one. Number one, how do I change an attitude? The first one's going to be repent. No, I'm sorry, that's not the first one. The first one's going to be recognize you have an attitude. So they're all little R's, recognize, you got to see it, because a lot of times we're blind to it. And I'm going to go over this and over this so that you're going to be so bored with this tonight that you're going to go home and in your sleep you're going to, you're going to say, recognize. The next one is repent. And the third one is renew. So recognize we have an attitude. Repent of that attitude and renew and refocus and redirect our thoughts and our behavior towards something else. And I'm going to show you what that is tonight. Okay, so that's going to be the same. It's a little formula, but God knows we need simple instruction. So are you ready? Number one, recognize I have an attitude. Let's say it. Recognize I have an attitude. So, Jessica, could you just turn to your father? Could you just say to him, you need to recognize that you have an attitude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just wanted to see what he'd do. <laughs> All right, back to, back to this. Well, he teases me all the time. I finally get to do something with him. Yeah. He has no attitudes. He's perfect. He is as close to Jesus as it gets. Sometimes. Okay. So 
we are going to recognize it. We are going to repent of it, which means that we, we look at it from a different perspective. God wants us to have heaven's perspective. That's what repent means, to change, to change your thinking. And we have earth perspective. And God has a whole different view and outlook of life than we do. And that's why this is such an exciting walk with God, because what you think you can't do and you can't be and can't happen is totally doable in the kingdom of God. But you have to change your perspective, and you have to change the way and how you look at life. Because i got to look at life like God sees life and not how I see life. God wants heaven's perspective down into the earth through the body of Christ. He doesn't want earth's perspective coming up into heaven because there's no faith in that. And God says the just shall live by faith. So I'm going to have to, number one, recognize I've got an attitude. Number two, I'm going to have to change my thinking, repent. And number three, I'm going to have to renew my thinking, refocus my direction. So let's look at these three attitudes. Number one attitude. Now this is going to be my attitude towards God. The second is going to be my attitude towards others. And the third is going to be my attitude towards myself. So attitude number one, if I could get this and learn this, it would change my walk with Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Choose to follow and not to lead. Choose to follow and not to lead. In other words, as a believer, I'm going to have to change my attitude of having control of my life, of ruling my own destiny, and of making my own decisions. Because as a believer, I no longer belong to myself. I've been bought with a price. And the price that's been paid for me is the greatest price in eternity, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you're bought with a price, and if I'm bought with a price, then we no longer belong exclusively to ourselves. We are no longer independent of. We are now completely and absolutely under God's authority, and we belong exclusively to him. And he is a jealous God over us. And I want to take you to the book of Joshua. And when I was on vacation, I was reading this, and God ministered this to me. And this is a story, and this is a, a rehearsal of when Joshua was leading this new generation across the Jordan, and they were about to go into the Promised Land, and they are about to take the first city, which is Jericho, the walled city. Now, this generation has been 40 years in the wilderness. They have watched their parents die off. They are the generation that had mothers and fathers that were slaves in Egypt. And these mothers and fathers, when they had the opportunity to go into the promised land and to take the promised land 40 years before, they had refused. And Moses had sent out 12 spies. Two, Caleb and Joshua had come back with a good report. Ten princes of Israel that had gone out with them came back with a negative report. The negative report turned the entire nation of Israel against the plan of God. They refused to go take the promised land. And God was so angry, he was about ready to wipe them all out. Moses intercedes for them. And God says, then what they said I would, that would happen to them is going to happen to the, what they said would happen to their children is going to happen to them in the wilderness and not one of them will see the promised land and they will all die off and their children I will raise up to take this land so this is now the second generation so you love your mom and dad and I'm sure they love their moms and their dads they were 40 years with them in the wilderness and they watched them die and these kids that are now men and women are with Joshua and they are ready to cross the Jordan and they are ready now to go to the first battle, and that is Jericho. And it is a massive city with massive walls. So Joshua is extremely careful. He is listening to God. They don't want to make the same mistake twice. And Joshua has them circumcise themselves at Gilgal. They cross the Jordan, and God heaps up the waters of the Jordan. It's an amazing story. You can read about it in the book of Joshua. God is doing miracles and elevating Joshua in the sight of all of Israel. This whole new generation now is ready to take Jericho. And this is what happens. As Joshua is in the plains of Jericho, if you'll go with me to the book of Joshua and look with me in verse number, chapter number 5. And Joshua is there with the armies of Israel. Manna has just ceased. They've eaten for the first time from the produce of the land. And in chapter 5 of Joshua, verse 13... 
Joshua has an experience. And it says in verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now stop just there for just a moment. Now remember, they're going into battle. They know that this is a walled city. The spies have come back. The two spies have come back. They've already met Rahab. They've come back and they've told Joshua, listen, that their hearts are melted because of what's happened. They are afraid of us. And Joshua has just circumcised them. They've been healed. The men have been healed. They're now ready for war, but they don't have the battle plan yet. And Joshua in those plains of Jericho lifts up and he sees a man. And that man in my Bible is a capital M because this is a Christophany. This is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus Christ, all God and all man. All things were made by him and for him and through him and without him nothing was made that was made. He wasn't just born as a babe in Bethlehem, which he fused with humanity, but he is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the everlasting father and he is eternal. And there he meets Joshua on the plains of Jericho. And Joshua says to him, are you for us or for our adversaries because Joshua does not know who he is and he says in verse 14 no and I love that he says no I'm not for you and I am not for your adversary but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him what does my Lord say to his servant and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off of your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, how do I know this is a Christophany? Because only God will receive worship. Angels of God will not receive worship and they will get you off of your feet and back up on your feet and tell you not to bow before them. They are fellow servants of God. So this is an appearance of God in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, commander of the Lord's army. But here's what I want you to see. God isn't for us and God isn't against us. He's not for my team and against your team. God is for God. God has one agenda and one agenda only. He happens to be the creator of heaven and earth. He happens to be the maker of all life. He happens to be everything that ever was and is and all things that were ever made emanate from him because he alone has life, Zoe life, the God kind of life. He alone is the divine and sovereign and magnificent and perfect king and he is not for me and against you. God is for his plan himself. I love what that commander said, what Jesus said. He said, no, I am commander of the Lord's armies, and I am fulfilling God's plan. Now, remember, the attitude is I'm going to have to choose to follow and not to lead. Because God doesn't have me lead. He has me follow. And to follow God means that I've got to believe God. It means that doubt and unbelief that rebellion and disobedience can have no part of my life. And there is an attitude that we can get as life continues on in the Christian walk. There's an attitude that can creep in. Remember, attitudes are feelings and thoughts that begin as thoughts and motivate us into action. And they become habits. And if you have been weary and well-doing, if you have been believing God and something didn't happen, if something God did disappointed you or God allowed something in your life or didn't stop something, and before you know it, you have withdrawn from God and you've gotten cold from God and you've gotten cold on the church and you've withdrawn. You used to be in the front row and now you're in the middle and before you know it, you're going to be in the back and then you're out the door. Come on, somebody. You see, in an attitude of faith, when I am for God and I am under God and I belong to God exclusively, in the very, very, very center of faith is a concept called loyalty. There is no faith without loyalty and commitment. 
It's actually called covenant, blood covenant. That I'm in this for the long haul. I belong to God. I'm here for the good and I'm here for the bad. I'm here for the blessing and I'm here when it doesn't seem like I'm blessed. I'm here when I feel him and I'm here when I don't feel him. I'm here day in and day out, every day on this planet. I follow him regardless of what happens in my life because he is God and he alone is God in heaven and he alone is God in the earth. And whether I like what's happening in my life, whether I feel that it's fair or just if I feel like God's not listening I cannot let that begin to develop an attitude of rebellion and disobedience and unbelief in my life and it is so subtle and before you know it I have known listen I've been at this for 35 years I I cannot even begin to tell you the people that have come through my life thousands have come through this church Thousands upon thousands had said yes to Jesus at the altars. Now, we've either built mega churches all over Southern California, or people have said yes one day and left and changed their minds and walked away from the gift that God wants to give them, which is new life. It all begins with an attitude, and it begins with unbelief. You know, we live in a world of unbelief. It's so subtle, it creeps in. You watch the news, you watch television, you go to movies, you listen to the secular world every day because you're in this world. And if you don't fill yourself up, if I don't fill myself up with God's presence and God's word, before you know it, it begins to leak out of me. Faith begins to leak away from me. And before you know it, I become weak and I get attitude. And the attitude starts with my heart getting a little hard and a little cold. I used to be passionate, but I'm not so passionate anymore. I used to be on fire, but I'm not so on fire anymore. Faith has a corresponding attitude of submission and brings about an action of obedience. Unbelief has a corresponding attitude of rebellion and brings about an action of disobedience. And doubt stands at the crossroads every day of our lives to route us into the lane of rebellion. And don't kid yourself, it can happen to every single one of us. You can have a crisis of faith in your life. What is that? Where you wake up one morning and for no reason, all of a sudden you just wonder, is this real? Is this real? What if it isn't real? Has anybody ever felt that way? See, let's talk about the elephant in the room, can we? Because every Christian faces this. And if you don't know this, and if you don't know what to do about it, then when it happens to you, you're going to be blown away. And before you know it, you're going to slip away. And the faith that you once had and the destiny that God has for you like Joshua and that generation, you need to hear the plan of God. That commander gave Joshua what he was to do to take Jericho. He got the the directions from the commander of the Lord's army to circle Jericho seven times and to shut their mouths. And we're going to see that in a minute. But he had to understand that God was was not on Joshua's side, that Joshua was under the authority and on the Lord's side and God's plans period period second corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 says we are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed we are perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed always carried about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life of jesus also may be manifested in our bodies for we who live are always delivered to death for jesus sake that the life of jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh so then death is working in us but life in you and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written i believed therefore i spoke we also believe and therefore we speak trouble is going to come persecution is going to come there will be things you don't understand there will be things that don't make any sense you'll have times in your life when you should be moving forward but it seems like you're going backwards that's what paul said i am perplexed but i'm not in despair we are troubled but we are not forsaken god will never leave us or forsake us he is with us at all times and we will stay the course we will hold the battle line and not run in fear and not walk away in selfishness but we will be people of courage 
integrity, loyalty, faith, and obedience to God. That's my attitude with God. I've got to choose to follow him. Jesus told Peter, follow me. When Jesus was restoring Peter after he had denied the Lord in John, the 21st chapter, he cooks dinner for Peter on the, on the shore of the Galilee. And Peter is destroyed and devastated that he denied the Lord, just like the Lord said three times. So what does the Lord do after the resurrection? He appears and he cooks them breakfast and he restores Peter. He brings him back and brings back the memory of the call because God's callings and God's gifts are without repentance. When God calls you, he does not change his mind. Only human beings change their mind. Only humans can be disloyal and full of betrayal. Our God is faithful to the uttermost, faithful to the cross, faithful to the resurrection, and faithful to his second coming because he is coming again, church. And Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And so if we are the last generation church, then maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to us because it says in the last days there will be perilous times, hard to deal with, and hard to bear. And God is telling us to get our attitudes right. He is not in my plans. I am in his plans. Peter is absolutely devastated. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times in John, the 21st chapter. Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? God, Lord, I've said this so many times to you. Lord, you know my heart. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And this is what Jesus says to Peter in John chapter 21. If you'll go there with me in verse 18. Jesus now begins to tell Peter, about what's going to happen. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But you are, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and you, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. He's talking about Peter being crucified. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. The attitude is choose to follow, not to lead. Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who's going to betray you? Obviously, this is John who's writing this epistle or this gospel. Peter, seeing him, says to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter's just been restored. Jesus has just told him what's going to happen. He turns around and he sees John and he says, well, if, I'm gonna, if this is going to happen to me, what about him? Now, is that not just human? Is that not like brothers talking to parents? Well, what about this one? Or what about how come that? And how, this isn't fair. What about them? And what does Jesus say? Follow me. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't look to your left and don't look to your right. Don't look at what ha is happening to somebody else. They may be getting blessed. They may be getting everything in the world that you've been asking God for. You're going backwards and they're going forwards. But if you want to keep the right attitude that will change your life and you'll come under the authority of God's destiny for your life and not circumvent what God wants to do, we're going to have to keep our eyes on Jesus and follow him and not look at this one and not look at that one and not compare ourselves to other people, to other families, to other gifts and callings, to other churches, to other jobs, to other wives and husbands, but keep your eyes on what God's given you in your life and follow him. Choose to follow and not to lead. Period. So how do I recognize if I am following or leading? Well, remember the three things, recognize I have an attitude, repent of it, and renew. So let's, let's look. So what do I do? Well, I guess the first thing I'd have to ask myself is, am I following or am I leading? Am I asking God into my life or am I getting into his life? That would be the first thing I'd ask myself because that's where the attitude starts. Then I guess it would be to repent, which means to get heaven's perspective, which I've just given you. 
and then renew. Renew means to replace something that is broken. To replace something that is broken. God says, I want you to renew your thinking. Your thinking, Debbie Cobre, is broken. You have a broken attitude, you have a broken heart, you have a broken life, and for your life to be fixed and for you to think the right thoughts that will bring into your life the right actions that will bring you to purpose and destiny that I have for you, you're going to have to renew and change your direction and your focus, and you're going to have to readjust your thinking. Because what you're thinking is right now is broken. So... Just like the angel of the Lord, the Christophany, Jesus Christ, gave Joshua the instructions on Jericho, we are going to have to sit at the Lord's feet, and we're going to have to come under his authority, and he will give us the marching orders for us. Listen, one thing a servant has a right to is to know the master's will for his life. We have a right to know what God wants us to do for our lives. You can ask him about who you're to marry, where you're to go, what you're to do. And he won't give you the whole plan all at once, but he will step by step lead you and guide you into his perfect will if we keep our attitudes, attitudes that are committed to loyalty and following the commander and not leading and asking God to get in line with what we want to do. Attitude number one. Number two, attitude number two. This is attitude towards people. I'm going to have to choose to connect and not to judge. This is about people now. First it was about God and me. Now it's about people and me. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, in the Message Bible, so, Message Bible it says, here's a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. What you want people to treat you like is how God says you're to treat them. God has called us to connect with other people. God has not called us to do life alone. And I have found in my own life and in the life of my family that it's very easy to isolate and get busy, and it's very easy to disconnect. As a matter of fact, it is easier to disconnect than it is to connect. Right now, we live in a world that is texting. We're not even speaking to each other anymore. We are typing in these little, tiny, little things that have little keyboards about this big with big, huge thumbs. And we are typing messages that take longer than if you just got on the phone and talked to somebody. And the spell check can drive you nuts. I have sent text messages that I can't imagine what they read because of the spell check. Has anybody else experienced that besides me? God has not called you and God has not called me to be isolated and to be alone. He's actually called me to be a part of something bigger than myself. The body, humanity, the family. And God is not pleased with my attitude when my attitude wants to disconnect, to isolate, and to grow sluggish and selfish, self-absorbed. We just went on a family vacation. We took eight of our grandchildren in one condominium with our children. There was 15 people in one condominium. I'm going to say one condominium many times. <laughs> one condominium. It was beautiful. We went to Mammoth, and we do this. We've done this for a couple of years now. And we, just, and we had a wonderful time, but we had to work at it because we had opportunity to fight. We had opportunity to withdraw. We had opportunity to get on each other's nerves. And Jim and I, as the patriarchs and the matriarch of the family, now that we are the old ones, we're not used to a lot of noise. And Emma's just a year and a half old, and Emma's been, she's had her little Bobby taken away from her, her little pacifier. So Emma has no pacifier now. And Emma can get a little cranky. She needs her little cigarette. I so understand that. I kept saying to Luke and Stacy, give her back her pacifier. Give her back her pacifier. No, Mom, she's fine. She's just being Emma. She's screaming and throwing herself on the floor and 
manifesting and, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm going to go find a pacifier. And I'm going to sneak it to her. We had opportunities to look at each other and see how different we've all become from the same family, but all different personalities and different giftings, different likes and dislikes. Some of us like this kind of food. I mean, I'm not going to say anything because she's sitting right over there. But there's one of my daughters who is a health fanatic, and she has absolutely gone into eating the right way. And I'm toxic, and so is Jim. If you, you, know, if you shine a light inside of us, we'd, we'd glow. <laughs> and so I would get a little lesson on nutrition every morning. And is she right? Yes, she's right. I'm looking this way. I'm not looking that way. <laughs> and now the child is telling the mom what to do. That's hard to take. Man, I used to change her diapers. I brought her into this world. I can take her out of this world. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Attitude. Attitude. You see, we had to have devotions every morning because we had to work this out. We had to actually confront issues, and we had to actually talk about problems, and we had to talk about the things that were bothering us so that we could work it out, pray it through, and have a great day for the rest of the day. We had to do that, because, and, and because we had put ourselves in a confined situation, we had to do it. We chose to do this. We chose to spend a lot of money to do this, a lot of money, <laughs> with eight children under the age of nine, okay? We have lost our minds, honey, yeah. Okay, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that this is the will of God. Because the closer you get to people, the more you see their imperfections. And the closer they get to you, the more they see your imperfections. But this is what God actually calls for in fellowship and friendship. And we're better together than we are apart. But we can get an attitude that we don't want to have friends or that we're too tired or we're too busy or we're this or we're that. I just wanted to give you a couple of scriptures and a couple of thoughts on this. It says in Proverbs 17:7, 7, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. We need family and friends. God called family and friends to help us through the rough places in life, to rub off on each other, and together we actually become better. Iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17, so as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Believe it or not, the closer you get to people, the better you become. I've got to recognize I need friends. So I guess if I had an attitude, we can ask ourselves some questions. Are we protecting ourselves maybe from hurts? Have we withdrawn from close relationships because we've been hurt? We've been bullied, we've been betrayed, we've been let down, and your heart's hurt, or your heart's been hurt, and you just don't want to mess with it again, and it's just, I come to church, I show up, and then I leave. I'm the first one out the door. I don't talk to anybody, I don't serve in the church, I don't do anything, I'm just here, I hear God's word, and then I go, well, good for you, but what good is that doing you? You see, it's not changing you. God didn't call us to devour his word and eat his word and 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 fellowship in his word, and then not to serve, because the serving is a manifestation of the word that we've learned. With love, we serve one another. Love is the bond and the glue that holds us all together. So if you've been hurt, if you've been discouraged, if you've been betrayed, if relationships have let you down, all I can say to you is welcome to the human race. This is life on planet Earth. Man is broken. Grace is the glue that puts man back together apart from the kingdom of God, the love of God, and Jesus Christ. We have no hope. But in him, we can now change our attitudes, change our hearts, and change our behavior so we can actually have healthy marriages, healthy families, and healthy relationships. And we can leave a legacy to the next generation. This is God's plan. So I guess... You could ask yourself, well, who are my friends? Do I have any? Because it says that you'll be known by your friends. Who are your friends? And then I guess we need to repent. We better get heaven's perspective because earth's perspective can be isolate, too busy, 
don't want to do this, don't want to do that. And God says, that's not, that's not what I showed you. Because Jesus was social. He had friends. He took his friends to the Garden of Gethsemane with him. He went to weddings. Hey, he turned water into really good wine. <laughs> Jesus knew how to party. It's okay to party. It's not okay to get drunk with wine because we're not to do that as believers. You can have wine, but don't get drunk with it. But it is wonderful when we laugh and play games and have friends and take time off and siesta and enjoy each other and fiesta and actually gather families together. And if you have a good family fight, don't sweat the small stuff. Get together, talk it through, make up, forgive quickly, and move on. You're family. Every family fights. Have the courage not to agree with everything. And don't be a people pleaser. Be a God pleaser. You can say, I might have a different perspective on that, and that's all right. We need to open our hearts up to different facets of the same thing. There's great variety in humanity, and God made us that way. Ask questions. If you don't have friends, this is now how to renew and how to renovate your life and have friends. Well, you got to be friendly, which means you're going to have to get into a group. Get in a small group. Volunteer at the church. If you're hurt in your heart, go to Breaking Free. It's on Tuesday nights. It's life-changing. It will change your life. You'll learn how to get healthy in your heart with relationships because people hurt people and hurting people keep hurting people and God wants us healed. Ask questions when you're in a group. Ask questions of somebody. If you don't know what to say, ask questions about their life. Listen, people don't really care about each other. If you're really interested in somebody, listen to what they're going to say and ask them questions. Now, don't get really nosy and bug them and get, have them get mad at you. But ask them some questions about their life and watch the heart begin to open. And before you know it, you're going to have a friend. You're going to go out and have some coffee. You can talk about the word. And don't be afraid that people aren't going to like you because once they get to know you, they're going to see how stupid and wicked and horrible you are. Well, of course you are. We all are. That's why we need Jesus. Hello. <laughs> He's made us wonderful. None of us are wonderful without him. We're all broken. But with him, we're fixed. And we get fixed working this out together. So the attitude of people is to choose to connect and not disconnect. Choose. Refuse to, do, to judge others. Learn to be a safe friend. What does that mean? It means that when people are in your presence, they know they're safe. You're not going to nail them with your judgment. Listen, everybody has a right to an opinion, but it's not always right to give it. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And maybe listen with, with the heart. Sometimes we listen and we judge so quickly on the outside. We nail somebody because they have an appearance and they look like this or they look like that. And boom, there they are. And they could have been somebody that God meant to be in your life and to have destiny with you. And because of judgment, I just kicked them right out of my life. I didn't even give God an opportunity to have them in my life. Because I've got an attitude of disconnecting, and I've got judgments and prejudice. Mother Teresa said this, there's nothing more calming in difficult moments than knowing that there's someone fighting with you in the war that God's put you in. God's called us to be the last attitude, my attitude towards myself. Number three, choose peace and not anger. Choose peace and not anger. I don't know what your life is like, but I notice that I'm getting frustrated I don't know if it's age. Jim said, now don't talk about how old you are, but uh, I guess I am. You know how old people are grumpy old people? Well, I don't want to be a grumpy old woman. But sometimes I have to admit I could be a grumpy old woman. And my family don't agree. <laughs> what is anger? What is it? Anger, a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. It makes you contentious, tending to arguments or strife. It can bring frustration, the feeling of being upset, annoyed, especially because of the inability to change or achieve something. I sometimes feel like screaming with frustration would be a sentence using that word. 
Frustration could be the prevention of progress, success, or the fulfillment of something. In other words, life is going to frustrate us. And in the last days, there'll be perilous times, hard to deal with and hard to bear. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, irreverent, blasphemers. We are living in a raw age. We are living in an age where you walk on eggshells with words, and yet you can act any way you seem to want to act and say anything you seem to want to say, except, of course, Christians. We're not allowed to. You notice that about our world. And it can produce anger and frustration. And before you know it, you're losing your temper all the time. You're popping off, and you know words that you didn't speak for a long, long time now are flying out of your mouth. Hmm. I must be hitting a nerve here. We live in an angry world and a frustrated world. And that attitude, that behavior can become part of our lifestyle before we even know it. And God says, listen, don't do that. Because that's going to circumvent my destiny for you. And this is not what I've made you for. And I've got to end this very quickly. But let's just look at a couple things about anger. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus have the opportunity to be annoyed displeased or frustrated? The answer to that is yes. We see that he said many times, how long must I bear with you, O ye of little faith? Can you imagine God walking on the earth and seeing how stupid we are and still loving us? That's amazing to me because we can be pretty stupid. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In the message, it says, go ahead and be angry. You'll do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. Don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Anger can become a manipulative tool that gets your way. And people are afraid to be themselves in your presence or to give you an honest opinion because they don't want your wrath. They don't want my wrath. They don't want my attitude. So they'll just... Be a man pleaser and say, yes, Debbie, yes, this, yes, that, because I'm popping off. See, that's totally contrary to the kingdom. Totally contrary to the kingdom. And I know, I'm being honest with you, and I know that some of you are experiencing this yourselves. It can come from frustration. It can come from being in the doldrums. It can come from having not things work the way you thought they should. So how do I change a bad attitude of anger and frustration? Well, i got to recognize that I have one. Am I always losing my temper? Is my fuse, has it gotten short? Ask yourself this question. Do I have a short fuse? Because you see, love is long suffering. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffering. Love doesn't gossip about other people. Love is long suffering. So I guess I'm gonna have to recognize that I have one, whatever that answer is when you ask yourself that question. So how do I fix it, God? Well, I've gotta repent, I've gotta get heaven's perspective. You know, God gives us a beautiful perspective with James and John and Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, I'll just quickly tell you this story. They're going into Samaria. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus has his face set like a flint. He's about to go to the cross. He goes to a Samaritan village, and this is what happens in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw, because the Samaritans didn't want him to stay, they wanted him to leave because he wasn't going to go to their temple. He was going to pass on through and go to Jerusalem. And they got mad at him, and they just told him to move on. So the disciples are mad. They're angry. And John saw this and says, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? But he turned and he rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. What he said is, sons of thunder, that was James and John. He said, you don't even know what spirit you are of. The old nature, the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Call fire down like Elijah did on the prophets of Baal. That is not this dispensation. That is not this kingdom. That is not what I'm here to reveal. You don't know who you are and who you belong 
Two, I am the Prince of Peace. He has bequeathed his peace to us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. As far as it concerns you, it says in Romans chapter 12, be at peace with all men. Jesus taught to turn the other cheek. He taught us to pray for our enemies. He taught us how to take anger and turn it to something productive. Be angry, but don't sin. Righteous anger is angry and zealous for God's plans but it does not destroy people in the anger that's the only anger we're allowed to have and when we have a short fuse when we're always frustrated when something is always bugging us then we better stop look at our attitude talk to God recognize we have one repent get heaven's perspective and renew Replace something that is broken. Use Jesus' example. And this is my last scripture for tonight. Romans 12, 18 through 21. If there is injustice, if somebody's bugging you, if somebody's on your last nerve, if people, and again, this is usually people. If it's innate objects, then we're really screwed up getting angry at something that has no life. Please, get a hold of yourself. I mean, I can get so mad at the car. It's all the car's fault. How stupid is that? Romans 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. When that one is getting on your last nerves and you want to yell at them and rail against them and be mad at them and disconnect from them and separate from them, God says, this is not what you're to do. You're to pray for them, listen to their heart. You don't know what they're going through. Maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe they've got their own set of circumstances and they really need somebody to talk to. You see, there's so much in our destinies that we can circumvent because of bad attitudes. Don't go to bed with your anger. Whatever you do, God says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it before the sun sets, God says. Forgive quickly. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. God doesn't want us to vent all of our feelings and act like fools and always be angry people. He wants us to be peacemakers. He wants us to reveal his peace. He wants to have an attitude, not of stress, but an attitude of joy, an attitude of faith, and an attitude of love. So, beloved, attitudes, they can change our destinies. What did we learn tonight? Well, what will change my life? Number one, I'm going to have to choose to follow and not to lead. My attitude with God. Number two, choose to connect and not to judge my attitude with others. Number three, choose peace and not anger, my attitude with myself. How do I change? Recognize that I need to, repent, get heaven's perspective on the issue, and renew, replace what was broken with the new creation reality of who Jesus is and the new nature that he's put on the inside of us. So, I have one more thing I want to do before I dismiss you, and you've been wonderful. I just love our family. You're just amazing people. But I need to ask a question because I don't know everyone here, and I certainly can't see everyone here because I took my glasses off. But I need to ask you, what's going to happen to you when you die? Are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? And, I mean, we've been together now for an hour. I've talked about everything, about our families, about our lives. So what about when you die? And I think most Americans don't want to think about it, but it's all going to happen to every one of us. Every one of us are going to die. Are we going to heaven or are we going to hell? And some Americans and some people may be saying, well, I think I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. All good people go to heaven. I think I'm going to heaven. Or maybe you're saying, well, I hope I go to heaven. I'm hoping. I'm not sure, but I'm hoping. I'm trying. And I have to talk to you because you can't think your way into heaven. You can't hope your way into heaven. And you can't behave your way into heaven. God says there's only one way to his heaven, only one way. He's the king. He's made this. It's his heaven. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of earth. 
And God says there's only one way, it's his way. And he says you must be born again. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us because you and I could never behave our way into heaven. You could never be good enough for God. And God knew that you and I have all sinned. We've all missed the mark. And we can't pay the price to get us to heaven because it would cost more than we could pay. The only one that could pay that price was God himself. And Jesus taught us and showed us how to get to heaven and he showed it through a man named Nicodemus. It was very clear one night Nicodemus was a great rabbi in Jerusalem. He came to Jesus at night. He said, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, with all sincerity of heart, he was an older rabbi, an older, older man. And he said, I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, Humanity got us on this planet. A woman and a man came together and boom, here you are, born of the flesh. But you're made in the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. And I'm not just a body, but I'm also a soul and a spirit. My spirit is made in the image of God. And my spirit was separated from God. That's called death. When I was born into that sin of this planet, every one of us was. And my spirit has to be born again. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're already born of the flesh, but now you've got to be born of the Spirit. And this is how this is going to happen. Here's God's plan. I'm going to a cross. And you can read this in John, the third chapter. And Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. And I will draw all men unto myself. And Nicodemus, if you'll look to that cross and if you will believe in your heart, believe that I am the Son of God, that I've died for you, that God will raise me from the dead, and he is. He's raised from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. If you'll surrender your heart and your life to me, let me be Savior. Let me be Lord. Nicodemus, you'll be born again. It's called saving faith. You see, God's already given us this amazing gift of salvation, but he cannot make us take it. We have to receive it. He's given us a free will. He's given us the ability to choose him or to reject him. There's no other way to God's heaven. God didn't make us for hell. He made us for heaven. He made us in his image. But not everybody will be going to heaven. Because there's going to be one thing and one thing only that he will ask you when you die and you meet God. What did you do with my son, Jesus? Did you receive him or did you reject him? There's no other way for salvation. It's God's plan. It's not mine. I'm just the messenger, and I'm the inviter. And God has brought you here tonight because he loves you, and he has a plan for your life. And he brought you here to change your life and to change your destiny and receive his son. You know, some of you have been running from God instead of to God, and I'm talking to you. Some of you are good people and you've been trying to change yourselves and you've been seeking God but you haven't yet surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus what does that mean to surrender your heart and your life it means instead of being a little in and a little out come here and once in a while show up for church and you're thinking about God it means making that commitment saying yes to God yes I believe yes I surrender here's my life and if you've never done that tonight God's opening up an invitation and an opportunity for you to get right with God. So if you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you all over this auditorium. He's not in shock over your mess ups. He knows what you're doing. He knows where you're living. Some of you are thinking, oh, I know I need to do this, but, but you don't know what I'm living in. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know the secrets I have. No, I don't, but God does, and he's the only one that can fix it. He's bigger than your problems, your addictions, and your distrust of yourself. When I came to God so many years ago, I was a mess, and I disappointed God so many times, I didn't want to do it one more time. But when I came with a whole heart and said, God, I can't fix me, but you can, and here's my life. God took me and changed me. And here I am today, 40 years later. God can fix you.
but you have to give him your life. So I'm going to ask in just a moment, if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand and say, yeah, this is what I need to do. I know I'm here tonight, and this is what I need to do. We're going to do it together. I'm going to count to three. I'll hit this pulpit and just go bam like that. When Jim hits it, it's really loud. When I hit it, it's really wimpy. So listen. Why do we do that? Eyes up, heads up. Because we figure it this way. If you can't say yes to Jesus in a place like this that's praying for you, that's believing for you to come and give your life to the Lord and change, how can you walk out those doors and live for Jesus in a hostile world? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. You see, we need to get over embarrassment and get over what people think because it's not about what people think. Nobody's going to be with you at the throne of God. It's going to be you and God. You won't be embarrassed then. You'll be glad that you said yes to Jesus Christ and that you're a child of God. So don't let one moment of embarrassment stop you from doing what you know your heart is telling you and the Spirit of God is telling you to do right now. So all over this auditorium, let's get right with God. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Lift them high. I see that hand. I see that hand. Lift them high. I see that hand. I see that hand. What am I, selling knives at the fair? If you need to get right with God, get your hands up. We're not playing patty cake with God. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? We're not messing with God now. He's real. He's either God or he isn't. This is either all true or none of it's true. And beloved, it is true. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And there is a God that loves you, that gave his son for you. But he cannot do any more than he's already done. It's your turn now. I see that hand. This is what I want us to do. I see that hand. I want us to stand up as we sing this song. If you raised your hand or if you didn't and you should have, grab your purse, grab your Bible, grab a friend, grab whatever you need to grab. Get out of your seat. Meet me in this aisle and let's get right with God tonight. Let's do it quick. Quickly come. Quickly come. Awesome. Well, you can smile. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. Yours. God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's been waiting for you. You've got angels assigned to you. They have been on double duty keeping you alive, and they're having a party right now. They are partying in heaven. They've been waiting for this day. This is Dr. Becker. We're going to take you into our special place. We're going to pray with you there privately. Your, your family can meet you there. We won't keep you long. This is Dr. Becker. If you'll just make a left turn and follow Dr. Becker. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words, say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth 
that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.